So welcome everyone to the London Developer User Group for February 2021. Uh, today we are going to have an excellent talk about data protection on Salesforce uh, and how to not break it and hopefully not get arrested or fined for it. That's a good thing, right? But, for, uh, but first, before we do that, uh, here is an agenda for today. So we've done our bit of chatting. We're going to do a bit of community news in a minute. Uh, then we're going to have our talk. We're going to have a couple of quizzes. And of course, we, we give out prizes for the winners of this quiz. So pay very close attention to what goes on in the talk because it might just uh, land you a certification voucher. And then we're going to have a really long talk about why blueberries aren't blue. Um, I don't know why, but uh, maybe some of you do. And then we're going to have some more chit chat. Uh, before we get started, as always, a huge thanks to our sponsors, BrightGen and Mobile Ca uh, Caddy. BrightGen is obviously, as you probably noticed, sponsoring our Zoom session and Mobile Caddy, soon the recording and editing and all the YouTube work. So thank you very much to our sponsors. And this is what is going on this month in the Salesforce community. Spring 21 is now in production, and it is with great sadness that it seems that dynamic forms for standard objects did not make it into this release. Um, I was, I, I, you know, I was sure they were going to make it, and I was on a call with a client today, today, like a couple hours ago, right? And he was telling me, can I make a field invisible on a contact based on whether or not this checkbox is ticked? And I was like, yes, you can. I was so excited because I thought it was already on standard objects. I was so excited. I said, yes, go on your sandbox, click edit page, show me that, click on that um, uh, record details component. And there was nothing there. And I, no, did you maybe, is your sandbox not updated? Did something happen? What's wrong? What's wrong? And it took me a while to figure out that no, it just didn't make it into spring 21. But there are lots of other cool features and we're going to be talking about them also very soon. Very soon, uh, our favorite in uh, in March. So on a, in our March event, we're going to have you guys talk about your favorite features from Spring 21. And then we're going to have a big vote as well as to whose favorite feature is the best feature. So we're basically going to push all the good features together in a big arena and make them fight to the death and see who the who the winner is. And of course, we have London's Calling in just about a month's time on the 19th of March. Uh, London's Calling, as you know, Europe's uh, largest Salesforce community event, not to mention the UK. Um, and Todd, if you wanted to say a few words about London's Calling, you want yeah. a minute? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Anon. Um, yeah, so for those of you who, who don't know, as Anon's just said, um, this is Europe's largest um, Salesforce community event and we're in our sixth year now, um, which is um, yeah, quite a, uh, quite amazing thing on the inside of it to see the number of people willing to put up their time um, in to talk. Uh, we've had over 200 talks um, already in our past five years now, and these are available on the website londonscalling.net. Uh, this year we've got um, close to 60 talks in. Um, they're not all developer focused. We have ones for um, admins at all levels. Uh, marketers this year has got a, a, a focus. Um, architects and then also some some general talks as well. So hopefully there's there's content for everyone there. Uh, the tickets are available now. Um, and actually, I've got a sneak preview here. I don't think for those of you who might know, London's Calling have t-shirts every year and i've got the very first one which is here look at that nice fancy and and todd can you tell us who makes and designs these t-shirts and where do the proceeds go because we're all dying to know oh that's a really good question actually so um this t-shirt uh, this year london's calling because it's a virtual event um and we still want people to have t-shirts um they're now available via shirt force um which is a uh, what do we call it a um social enterprise let's call it a social enterprise where members of the community put in their designs um via me if you want um, and we then publish them out they get put onto t-shirts and then members of the community can buy them and all the profits go to charity 
Uh, and every month, every three months, sorry, we rotate the charity uh, that we're targeting with the profits. And this quarter is uh, the Foundation for Female Education, um, which was nominated by one of our um, one of the members of the community. In fact, I don't know if Lawrence is on the call. He might be. Oh, he's not. Uh, but yeah, he nominated that charity. So if anyone likes the T-shirts in general, um, check out shirtforce.org. Um, and if you're going to run the calling, then I'll be posting links up soon for you to buy those T-shirts as well. Um, they're at a reduced rate, of course, we don't want to, like, we want our community to buy those T-shirts. And um, we're still a portion going to charity. And then there'll be prizes on the day on the 19th of March um, for people who are wearing their shirts. Um, you'll be in a draw for that kind of thing. Um, I think that's it. What have I spoken about? We've got tickets are open. We've got loads of amazing content. Um, definitely people on this call I recognise are speaking for us so I'm, I'm pretty sure the quality is going to be ace um, yeah and join us join us then any questions feel free to ping me in the chat by the way or on Twitter at Todd Halfpenny um, yeah cool thanks and I appreciate that oh, of course yeah. um, if anyone else has any any news that they want to share with us anything uh, relevant for the Ohana feel free um, to, to let us know We'd be happy to share things that, uh, you know, or any good news or people who passed their first certification, go ahead and tell us because we're all excited to hear. Uh, to those joining now, I'm not actually a cat. I am a human being and I don't know how to take the filter off. Um, I just don't want to share my biometric information anymore. Viva la, re la revolution. Um, and I think it is time to get on with our talk tonight, we have Surab Gupta, who is going to talk to us about GDPR and implementing it correctly on Salesforce. Um, so with without any ado, up to you. All right. Thank you so much, Amnon. I think this the cat filter is really hard to, to <laughs> compete with. So hopefully <laughs> I'll be able to get some attention. Sure. Here, I'll, I'll turn it off. It's okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm sharing my screen. You guys can see my screen, right? Yep, we can see it. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Saurabh Gupta, and uh, we are going to talk about data privacy in Salesforce, a very interesting and rather long and complex topic. I've tried quite hard to hopefully compress it into the amount of time we have. Uh, but if you have questions, please put them in the chat or you know ask ask away. Uh, let me start with a disclaimer. Used to be called Safe Harbor back in the day. Uh, this is not legal advice. We are not Salesforce. This is our point of view. We are not a law firm either. We are a Salesforce ISP partner and a technology company. Um, I'd begin with thanking all of you and some of our customers for the faith that they have entrusted in us uh, for their data privacy and security requirements. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time. I think this is a topic that's important and it will continue to become important as more and more um, regulations uh, you know, come to bear. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Saurabh Gupta. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Cloud Compliance. Um, we are a Salesforce ISV partner. I used to work for Salesforce. I was with salesforce.com and then with .org uh, for about seven years. Uh, as the global enterprise architecture uh, director there um, before starting uh, cloud compliance. Um, from a background, I've spent a lot of time in enterprise architecture. Uh, I have a, a background in design, uh, very intrigued by problems and trying to solve them. I'm fairly active on LinkedIn and you can reach out to me there or on our website. I'm based in Chicago where it's about minus 16 degrees Celsius right now and about six inches of snow. So do not be complaining about weather for me. <laughs> um, a little bit about what we do is, uh, you know, we are in the business of making compliance simple. We are a Salesforce native solution and we address these six key areas related to data privacy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of the requirements and what options customers have and things like that, but that's who we are about. You can get more information on cloud compliance dot app app uh, about what we do. With that, let's jump quickly into the agenda. 
So we'll talk a little bit about why bother with data privacy laws. You know, what's the implication? What should companies think about? You know, if, particularly if you're based in Europe or if you're a global business, uh, what kind of technology capabilities do you need for data privacy compliance? Uh, you know, just from a requirement perspective, and we've been in this business for about two and a half years now, and we've talked with a lot of customers and seen some interesting trends in how customers approach it. Uh, what Salesforce features exist? What Salesforce add-on or products exist? What are the other considerations? We'll talk a bit about that. We do have a trial for data masking. That's uh, our one of our product that we completely redesigned and re-architected, and we are getting a lot of traction in the market. So, if any of you is interested, uh, you know you could definitely reach out. Jens is my colleague based in Amsterdam. He's on the call as well and you could reach out to him. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the resources that are available, some information that's useful for people, particularly if you're a technologist trying to understand what some of these regulations are about, and then any question and answers that you may have. Um, so let's start with why bother with data privacy laws and what is this all about? Um, the bottom line is if you, this is, Quite bluntly, this is regulatory authorities all over the world trying to catch up with technology. Um, come out of the dryer. Uh, I can't find any clothes. Sorry, uh, I think someone's on, not on mute. Could you please go on mute? Um, so, yeah. so bottom line is that, uh, you know, this is regulatory authorities trying to catch up with technology. You know, we have a ton of technology available today as 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 businesses, right? So we can scrape information, we can put together some sort of comprehensive data sets, we can buy information from third party. And all of this personal data was just freely available for anybody to grab because for a very long time, there were not enough strong regulations in place to, to address this. And what's changed in the last uh, few years is that a number of regulatory authorities all over the world have uh, you know woken up to this reality and they're updating these regulations to make it quite, uh, you know, quite uh, restrictive of how this information can be used in a good way. And so bottom line of this is that businesses today are required to treat personal data fairly, transparently, and lawfully. And all of these terms have very specific meaning in GDPR. But basically know this, that as a customer, as a consumer, as an employee, as a partner, as a volunteer in a nonprofit or any any interaction you have with an organization, your personal information needs to be treated in a certain sense, in a certain way. And that is now mandated by law, depending on you know, whose information you're processing, laws of that residency would apply. Um, so what that really means is a number of these data privacy laws, such as GDPR, California, CCPA, Brazil's LGPD, and a ton of others that we'll kind of take a look at, a lot of these laws accord specific rights to us as individuals and uh, businesses are obligated to address and comply uh, with these regulations. One thing that's really interesting and different about this new generation of regulations around privacy mm -hmm. is that they have a cross-border enforcement. That was not the case a while back. So if I'm a company based in Mexico, China, India, somewhere else outside Europe, I may be doing business in Europe, but you know, your laws don't really apply that much to me, particularly if I am an online e-commerce type business, I don't have physical presence in your country or region. What are you gonna do, right? I'm going to comply with the laws of my land, wherever that happens to be. That's changed with privacy laws. If you are a business based in the US, actively doing business with people in Europe, you're obligated to comply with GDPR, even if you have no single office in Europe. That's a very, very key difference in how a lot of data privacy laws have, uh, have come about. It's true for GDPR, true for LGPD, and like a bunch of other regulations that are either uh, in force or about to get enforced. So definitely something to think about when you know, you're looking at requirements for this, that it's not so much about where you are based, it's about whose data are you processing, the residency status of people. Europeans, Brazilians, Californians, you know, all of those regulations are meant to safeguard their information and their interest, and your business is obligated to, to comply with them. These are also laws with a fair amount of teeth. I'm sure, particularly since a lot of you are based in Europe, you're probably fairly familiar with GDPR and the kind of financial weight it carries. I think because of COVID, it was a little bit 
slow in, in between, but I think it's now catching back up and you're seeing a lot of fines in, in Europe, you know, around violation of GDPR. Uh, a number of other laws are quite similar in terms of their enforcement, like LGPD from Brazil, I think it's 2% of the annual Brazilian revenue of a company. So if you're a company that does 30, 40, 50% of your business in Brazil, that's a huge penalty, you know, to kind of deal with. CCPA in California is $7,500 per record. So if you, God forbid, if a business has a breach and they leaked out 10,000 Californian records, you know, you could be fined up to $7,500 per record. And CCPA has gone through a new revision uh, called CPRA that gets enforced uh, in 2023 with a look back to data collected in 2022. So really in another 10 and a half, 11 months, companies that are dealing with California residents, if you actively do business in California, which is probably 80% of the world, at least the kind of companies that we are talking about. And if you do that, you really don't have a significant amount of time. So we can't just sit here and twiddle thumbs and say, okay, it's 2023, we have two years. We really don't. Um, so that's on the sort of evolving landscape of privacy. And, and this also kind of, uh, you know, overflows into data security because a number of requirements around this are for data security. In addition, we are now seeing with COVID, right? Everything is moving online. Customer trust has become so much more important as a business viability scenario. I'm not gonna buy online if I don't feel comfortable with your website. Uh, it was quite different when you could walk into a store because the physical presence emanated trust. You're like, you know, this is a 50,000 square foot store. They probably have everything in place. When you look at a website, you may not get that sense. So marketeers are, you know, much, you know, this, a lot of these initiatives are now coming because of a push from marketing, not just from compliance. There are like other segments within their business that want to drive this forward. In addition to this, uh, you know, quite simply in terms of dollars and cents, and I apologize, I should have put this in pound sterling, but uh, in terms of dollars and cents, you know, uh, an average GDPR fine could be anywhere around $80,000, which is probably roughly 60,000 pounds. And it has a direct impact on uh, your stock prices if you're a listed company. And you've probably seen a number of these, you know, cases with Facebook, with Google, with H&M, with British Airways, with Marriott, so on and so forth. And they all unfortunately point to something that in the past was like, you know, an afterthought for like, oh yeah, we have to comply with this thing and I need to do something for can spam and this and Sarbanes-Oxley and whatever regulations are in Europe like that. But what you're now seeing is that in addition to the idea of innovation, in addition to the idea of digital transformation, DevOps, like all of these things that are becoming more and more important, there is this another component, which is data privacy and data security. That is, you know, that's that that has come to the forefront and rightfully so, because there is a lot more thought in terms of you know, privacy by design and security by design that we have to think, particularly if you are building solutions you know, with Salesforce, if you're an architect, if you're an analyst looking at this, if you're a prog program project manager and assessing this, you want to allocate appropriate amount of time and, and thinking around how are we going to address these things. Um, worldwide, what's happening in this space, especially if you're a global company, is that like everything you see in red is where privacy laws have either been evolved, evolving or have been enforced, right? A number of these things are coming, like Brazil just implemented one last year, Canada is revising its PEPEDA, China has a draft waiting to go through their approval process, same with India, they have a draft. Uh, I was reading somewhere that today about 20% of the world's population is covered by data privacy laws. In the next five years, that number is expected to grow to 65%. I mean, primarily when you bring India and China into the fold, that's about two and a half billion people more that will be covered by data privacy laws. So if you are an organization, if your client is a, is a business that is global, GDPR is not the only thing you want to think about. There is a much broader, wider set of nuances to be considered. Um, so what we've heard and I put the screenshot and I'm sure there's newer incidences, but this was quite a big news, particularly in the UK when it happened. Uh, you know, this, this is kind of the awkward spot that no business wants to find themselves into, right? And when we speak with customers, Salesforce customers, 
this is what we hear all the time, right? Nobody wants to be in this place. They don't want to be fined, sued, or frankly, embarrassed. Like most customers I speak with, money in general is the least of their worries. It's definitely a worry. Nobody wants to pay a fine, but it's the embarrassment. It's the lack of trust, it's the brand erosion that they're very worried about. A lot of these customers want to address the right set of concerns, which quite honestly, the sense I get is to figure out what their right set of concerns is, particularly for Salesforce, that's a challenge. Like, what are the requirements? What am I complying with when we say comply with GDPR? Because a number of times they get a set of policies and requirements from their legal, but they don't get a solution of how do these legal requirements translate into what do I do in Salesforce? That's the space like we spend a huge amount of time in, right? And they all want to solve this problem in a manner which doesn't incur a lot of technical debt. They want their organizations to be future ready an architecture that makes sense and can evolve into bigger, better things as you embark on you know, more digital transformation, do other interesting things with Salesforce and as your business evolves. Um, so that's kind of what we heard. Um, before I move any further, any questions or comments? I think we can move on. All right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the privacy compliance and Salesforce requirements. I've put this wheel, you know, this is sort of the six products that we have, but it's really, we arrived at this because we initially had one product and every customer we spoke with, they kept on helping us crystallize into these six areas when you talk about Salesforce. And the sequence in which I'm gonna show you is the sequence in which customers talk about it the most. So it's really from the most uh, you know, common requirements we hear down to sort of, you know, less and less prevalent with when, it, when it comes to Salesforce. So the number one thing we hear from customers all the time, and it's the number one use case that, com you know, companies want to address are privacy right automation, right? Under GDPR, you as, as a you resident can go ahead and ask, well, sorry, not you residents anymore. You as people of United Kingdom or other people who are you residents, uh, you can ask for specific GDPR uh, rights. You can ask for your data, which is data portability. You can ask for your information to be removed from businesses that don't have a lawful reason to keep it anymore. You can ask for your information to be corrected, you know, things like that. This is the first requirement we hear from customers. They want to figure out how can they extract the right amount of data for someone who's making a portability request or how can they anonymize and remove personal data for a right to be forgotten uh, DS, data subject access request. So things like that, this is the first thing that we hear consistently. Uh, the next one we hear is really data minimization and retention. How do I anonymize or delete old data in Salesforce? Under GDPR specifically, uh, companies are required to have a data retention policy. And uh, you know they need to ensure that when that threshold is met, uh, that information is removed from your operational systems. So if your retention policy said that you can keep lead information for 13 months, I'm totally making this up, but if it's at 13 months, well, on 13 months and day one, you either go and delete that information or you anonymize it. A lot of customers like to do anonymization versus deleting because anonymization ensures that you can still report on it, right? I can take out personal information out of a lead record. I don't care if it was Saurabh Gupta's record, but I'm very interested in the lead source. I want to kind of try to campaign effectiveness. I want to tr you know, connect it back to the call center activity tracking of how many calls did we make? How many emails did we send before this person responded, you know, before a lead responded? What's the average? So a number of those kind of things are reasons for doing anonymization versus deletion. But in summary, that's the second most popular thing we, keep, we hear from our customers. Uh, the third area is really consent management and communication preference management. And the idea here is within GDPR, you need an explicit opt-in. So if I signed up for this event and you had a bunch of, you didn't, but if there were a bunch of those checkboxes that said, yes, you know, you can send me newsletter, you can contact me for other things, so on and so forth, then it, that information could be collected on that form and that should inform 
how you communicate or do an outreach to to these uh, to the people who attended your event. So how do you do an effective consent management? And then how do you integrate it with your marketing technology uh, you know, stack? So if you have marketing cloud, if you have Pardot, Eloqua, Market or MailChimp or anything else like that, if you're using Twilio or something else for SMS, how does all of that connect back? And that's actually quite a thorny issue. And uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but this in itself is just an incredibly complex problem for a lot of companies to solve. The fourth area that we hear about quite, quite consistently, and this is actually started to come up more and more now, is really how do I ensure that no sensitive data, whether it's personal information or business sensitive, so your quotes, your products, who do you sell to, right? If you're a B2B company and you're selling to arms manufacturer, you, that information is very valuable. How do I price my product and services in Brazil versus you know, China versus uh, UK? Like those kind of information. How do I ensure that all this business sensitive and personal data is only in my production org? And when, it, when I do a refresh to my full or partial copy sandboxes, how do I mask it? So data masking, which Salesforce uh, you know, also has started doing now, we've been doing it for about 18 months. And that's something that's coming more and more into conversation. Particularly if you're familiar with some recent data breach that happened in the US, particularly was solar winds. I think it was in September or November of last year. And a ton of uh, businesses as well as you know, government departments in the United States basically were breached because of a malware that was just sending data back to Russia or somewhere. And so that's the other thing. How do you ensure that that sort of things in future, how do you safeguard your business from that and mask data everywhere? Um, another area that we, we are starting to hear more in this space is how do I then integrate it with things like DevOps, right? If you're going to run DevOps, you've done metadata migration or something, then I want to flag this off and mask all the information uh, that's in, in these uh, sandboxes. So things like that. Um, the next is, uh, so this is kind of interesting. If I was describing this as a process for GDPR, I would start with the number fifth item here first. That's the first thing you do. But because this is a technical audience and we are, all about solutioning, I took an approach of where, you know, where you would want to kind of think about and focus more. But um, the number five here, generating inventory for personal data or personal data discovery is, is really one of the foundational ideas within GDPR. Uh, the term legally used for it is ROPA, uh, Record of Processing Activities. And essentially what you're doing here is you're trying to consolidate what all systems have personal data. Where is it? How is it stored? Who is it shared with? Where are you sourcing it from? How long do you keep it for? What's your lawful basis to have it? So things like that. So essentially, you're creating an inventory of personal data. Um, Salesforce has some features that allow you to do it. You know, we automate a lot of this, but this is one of the areas that, that keeps on coming up. And finally, it's all about transparency, right? How do you ensure that privacy policies and uh, you know, uh, notices are, are available. And how do you then ensure that if somebody accepts a notice, do you need to save an audit ready sort of proof of acceptance? How do you do things like that? This is not that frequent uh, within the Salesforce space, uh, but you know, we have customers who use that and, and we do this. So these are the six broad areas from a GDPR or frankly even CCP and LGPD perspective that keep, that keep on coming in. What you would find is these are also here because we are, I'm primarily a technologist and I run a tech company, <laughs> uh, but there are other areas that are not mentioned here primarily because they are not so interesting to, to us as a community, right? Organizations must have a DPO, right? There may be other processes, right? There's all this other legal aspects and regulatory and compliance aspects that are about people in process that are not in here. We are looking at this primarily from a solutioning and technology perspective. All right. So this brings up a question that, you know, if, if you're asked to solve this problem, if your you know, CXO says, hey, you know, we need to comply with these regulations. We haven't started or we did something. I had a bunch of Google Docs or something in SharePoint we were doing, but now we need a really good, you know, enterprise grade solution. What are my options and what do you think? So there are two areas to consider here, right? 
The first is you have a bunch of solutions in your enterprise. And this is a simplistic view, depending on how large you are, you may have 500, 1500 apps, uh, right? And then you will go, well, I'm gonna go and bring yet another standalone app for data. There's a ton of solutions, one trust, trust arc, Nimity, like there's a whole lot of them. You can bring one of those in and then you'll be like, great, I'm gonna integrate this because for something like this to work, it needs data, right? So you're gonna push data back and forth, You you know, sort of creates maybe a consent master. You would start a, you know, portal from here. You would take a request for right to be forgotten, kind of reach out to these systems, scrub that data, delete it, do something like that, right? That's the first solution that you would do. Your second option is you would do it with Salesforce. So Salesforce itself offers some options there. You know, we are one of the options that's natively built on Salesforce. And the idea is that you may already have existing integrations with things like marketing cloud, some backend systems and all that. And you're already invested in the space and you're leveraging it. So when you think about how you want to solution it, particularly from an enterprise perspective, you know, at least these two broad options exist. You either build a brand new standalone app yourself or you buy something and then you integrate it or you take Salesforce and you build it on top of Salesforce, which is kind of the approach we have taken and our customers are embracing, right? And obviously there are pros and cons, like yet another app, you do have adoption and learning curve. If you're doing anything with Salesforce, hey, it's Salesforce, your company probably already knows. You have all kinds of uh, change management processes, right? You're kind of leveraging the existing investments that you have in Salesforce. You don't have to do yet another set of sandboxes, another set of CI, CD, another set of integrations, another set of single sign-ons, like a whole lot of those things kind of are not needed anymore, right? Um, in a standalone app, you would probably need a connection with Salesforce to pull that personal data if you want to do something with it. In case of Salesforce, you can directly work with it because you, you know, your personal data is sitting in Salesforce or a, a majority of it is. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of something's pros and cons perspective. You obviously have a significantly larger integration requirement with a standalone app with Salesforce, you may have existing integrations so your cost overall becomes lower. This, in my opinion, uh, regardless of whose technology you use with Salesforce, this is kind of the use case of when you're an organization debating, how am I gonna automate? What is the approach to take? This is, this is kind of the heart of that discussion that we have a number of times with our customers. What's a good fit here, quite honestly, is that Salesforce is one of those rare platforms that has that started off as a business app and then completely became a legitimate, uh, you know, low code platform in its own right. Um, it makes it really easy to do, because what I've seen is when we talk to a number of customers who already have a standalone app and they're still buying our product, a part of it is because they either want to do things specifically in Salesforce or because a number of standalone, you know, app platforms don't have the robustness of automation that you get with Salesforce. So approval processes, workflows, process builders, flows, right? Things that uh, customers can use to take some existing thing and then make it just fit for them. You have a lot of opportunity to do so with Salesforce. So anyway, that's uh, on the enterprise perspective when you think about this. Let me now switch gears and talk about how can you address these requirements? right? Uh, what does Salesforce offer out of the box? What can you buy additionally from Salesforce? And what other options exist for those six, seven areas that we had looked at, right? So if you wanted to do privacy right automation, which is right to be forgotten, portability, things like that, you have the following option. You can build something custom with Flow, Apex, other things, probably use a communities to, you know, version to kind of have people come to this portal and open up a request. You know, either through web to case, email to case, something else, create that, go through this process. Uh, Salesforce has done some work in this space with customer 360 privacy center that they're now kind of slowly evolving. And you may be able to get some benefit out of that. On App Exchange, there is a bunch of products that allow you to do things like these. We happen to be one of them, and there are others. There's also, I think, some free Salesforce labs. Uh, uh, offering that go to some degree in some of these areas. Again, it's a question of how much do you build, how much do you buy, how much time do you want to spend you know, solving these problems. Um, the next one is data retention and minimization. 
not a lot of great options uh, unless you go completely off platform. So you could do, you know, custom code or build your own if you want to. You could do something off platform with Heroku or some other technology that you'd like to use, some of the product. We also operate in that space and we do it natively. So those are your options in that space. Um, moving on, so consent and communication preference management. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the objects around it, which is quite interesting in my opinion. in itself. Um, but what you can do is Salesforce out of the box does offer you a, a, a incredibly wonderful uh, data model that you can leverage, but that's all you get. You get a data model, um, which includes individual contact point type, consent objects, authorization objects, subscription object, like a ton of stuff, but it's just all. So you've got you know, this, and now you still have to write to do automation, to really just build the whole process because all you're getting is a bunch of objects. The good news is that uh, you know with these objects, you your storage doesn't count. So if you have you know five million uh, contacts and four million leads, and if you end up creating nine million individual records, those nine million individual records don't count towards your org storage, and that's true for all the consent objects. Uh, so this is kind of what's there today. Salesforce's customer 360 um, will include this sort of functionality and is building on it. Still in early days, but definitely that's an option that you could look at. Uh, from an app exchange perspective, we do this uh, and we integrate with you know Marketing Cloud, uh, Pardot, Marketo, Eloqua, things like that. Um, there is a, some other app, app that does this. I don't think they use the individual object, but that's an option. Um, all right, moving on. Sandbox data masking, not a lot of options. Uh, you could do custom code or Apex. You could also do Salesforce's uh, data mask that is not there. You also do this. And I think there may be another one or two products that have come in application, but in general, there's not that much, uh, op not that many good robust options in this space as far as I'm aware of. Uh, moving on. Personal data discovery, this is another interesting area. Salesforce does have, have offer you the metadata classification field. So if you go to set up object fields, you, know, you can now put that metadata of what kind of information is it? Is it PII, non-PII, you know, HIPAA sensitive, all of that. You can do that kind of stuff there. Uh, but it's not automated, you're manually entering that. You can, uh, I think you can run a report on top of it and see a report, you can export it, you can update it, you can do a bunch of things, uh, but it's not automatically going to scan your org and do something like this. That's kind of what we do in this space is you click a button and we'll scan your org, basically create a catalog of all of this, um, you know, and we apply some algorithm to figuring out which of these may potentially be PII so that you can look at them, things like that. And we do it in a manner where it is extensible you can bring in metadata from other applications, like if you have NetSuite or whatever else, you can bring that as well and manage one enterprise-wide repository of personal data. Uh, the, the one more thing that I'd mentioned earlier was really policy and notice management, where the idea is that you can have someone just, you know, your legal can just go into Salesforce, just update a bunch of records of policy and notice management, and you're generating out a version specific policy and notice management. And you can have different versions of it for different region, different languages, and eventually you know, successive versions where it's changing. Um, if you want to do something like this, you're basically either writing code or you could use Salesforce CMS with communities. Uh, we have customers that want a, a proof that a particular version of a privacy policy was accepted. So we've built that kind of functionality where you can do all of what I described plus when someone accepts this privacy policy on a particular date, we will basically bring back that proof and associate it to that individual record. So you know that Saurabh Gupta accepted this particular version of privacy policy on 1st of January, things like that. Uh, finally, one question that keeps on coming up is around data encryption at rest and how does that you know, factor in here? So when you look at products like Shield, um, they do data encryption at rest. It's a great thing to have you, if you need that kind of security, you know, absolutely go for it. But it doesn't address, you know, the other requirements which are very typical of data privacy and security from a GDPR standpoint. Uh, I put this here because a lot of customers ask us this question. 
But this is the lay of the land. When you think about the requirements from a privacy perspective, and you think of potential options you have of how you can address it. This is, I think, uh, you know, what we have found in the last two and a half years is this is how customers can think about it. And, and these are the areas to consider, you know, what we were looking at in the earlier slide um, of enterprise architecture and then specific solutions to address these key requirements in data privacy space. All right. That brings us to this interesting question on consent management. Um, these are the objects that you have in your org today. Actually, you may have more than this. This is probably one release old, maybe more. But these are standard Salesforce objects that are provided to you. The good news is it's an incredibly comprehensive data model. You can use it for, uh, you know, with the individual record. You can get authorization and store authorization proof. You can have a subscription, uh, you know, if someone said, contact me, if you want to call me between this and this time, great, call me on my phone. Otherwise, send me an email or do this or do that. So you can have all of that very, very comprehensively enabled and, and managed from this. The challenge is you're just getting a bunch of object. The entire logic around it, the process, the automation does not exist. So if you're going to go down this path, you'd have to spend enough time to figure out how are you gonna use these objects? What's the whole process? What's the automation? So we've spent <laughs> six to nine months kind of figuring it out and solutioning around it. And we now have customers who use this and really like how, how it's all set up. But uh, that's one thing I tell everyone. If you are on a new implementation, if you have an, you know, an org and you're kind of migrating it or doing something, the one thing you absolutely want to think about is the individual object. So individual object is really, in a very sort of simple way, individual object is the idea of master data management, right? This golden copy that you want to create. So think of individual as the human representation of a person. So Saurabh Gupta, the individual, can be connected to Saurabh Gupta, the contact, Saurabh Gupta, the lead, Saurabh Gupta, the user, community user, or whatever, right? Uh, and you may have me four times as a lead. You may have, because maybe I just wrote my name wrong, you don't have duplication management, whatever. You may have me a bunch of times, but what you can do is you can associate all of those records back to this individual record. And the reason you want to do this is everything else on this image, which is data privacy related, all these consent objects, subscription objects, authorization objects, they're all linked to the individual record. They're not linked directly to contact or lead. And by doing that, what Salesforce has done is it allows you to take these consent and communication preferences throughout the life cycle of your customer. So whether, you know, Saurabh signed up as a lead, you have Saurabh's preferences. He said, fine, you can send me in a marketing email. Don't send me an SMS. Don't call me. You have those. And, you know, your conversation with Saurabh went on. He got converted to a contact. You've created an opportunity. You now have, because there is an individual, you now have the ability to carry the same consent and communication preferences to sort of the contact. Eventually you give Saurabh access to a community's portal. You now have the ability to leverage the same consents across these. The challenge with this, this entire thing is that it directly doesn't really talk to marketing technologies. So if you use marketing cloud or power dot, and some of this may be coming, this is my current knowledge that today, if you do an unsubscribe in one of those platforms, there is nothing that's writing back to this structure. And we, we had to solve that problem and it's an interesting way to solve it, but that's one challenge. But honestly, if you think from an enterprise architecture perspective, this is the ideal approach, right? You've created this central entity in your enterprise where you have this person, Saurabh, right? And the whole uh, technology stack is revolving around his communication and consent preferences, right? Based on what Saurabh says, you can now ensure that your omni-channel marketing is approaching it that way. Your call center people can see, can I, can I call him? Can I not call him? What can I deal, dis, discuss with him? You know, what kind of things should I not contact, contact Saurabh for? Can we apply AI to this person? So on and so forth. Extremely interesting area, very large to cover. Um, all right. The second thing that I was mentioned earlier was uh, sandbox data masking. And the idea is that as things move from production to sandboxes, 
you want to essentially mask or delete all of this information. That's a space that we do work in. And uh, you know, we just redid this product and a lot of really large companies are very are finding quite a bit of joy in this. So if you're interested, that's something that we'd be happy to kind of help you, you know, do a free trial with. Um, Jens is on the call, Jens Kohler, and that's his email address. And you know, you can have a conversation with him if this is of interest to you. Uh, I think that's it. So a bunch of uh, resources. We are cloudcompliance.app. If you go to our site, go to solutions and GDPR, you'll see that each, everything that I mentioned, in addition, like specific articles under GDPR are listed. Like, why should you do this? Well, here are the articles. So the idea is that, you know, if you get these kind of requirements from your legal, or if you have to go back and talk to them, you can take something like this and just describe, here is how you can help them meet. Again, like I said initially in our disclosure, we're not a law firm. This is not legal advice. This is informational only. I hope it is helpful to you, but definitely consult your legal counsel on which of this is appropriate to meet which requirements. Uh, another area that's really useful, if particularly if you are dealing, if you do, if your company does business in the US, especially in California, CPRA is the California Privacy Rights Act that will be applied in retrospect to data collected in 2022 and above. This just unveiled, I think, yesterday. I, I know the gentlemen, the group of people who are running this. And this is an incredibly well done consume, you know, resource center to look at the CPRA requirements. A lot of them are similar to GDPR, uh, but there are other areas that where they are more stringent, I think, in AI and particularly for minors, there's a lot more in CPRA than I think there is in GDPR. Again, I have not fully read these, but a really useful resource if you're looking at things like this. Thirdly, we do run a meetup group. Uh, it's a small meetup group. Uh, we've re recently started it. If this is a space that is of interest to you, please do join. Uh, we're gonna be doing a lot of events later this year and we will be posting them out here as well. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, questions? Let me go look up. I think there were some in the chat. Any comments, feedback while I'm reading the questions? Let me go back. Hey, Tanjali here. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Really clear and uh, easy to follow. Um, I just had a question about, you talked about sandbox data masking and you said mm -hmm. something around no sensitive data access outside production. So can I ask, is that is that requirement driven from the legislation, from some legislation? Like how does that how is that reflected in the actual great question? Yeah. So it's twofold. One is uh, for a lot of uh, um, for a lot of uh, companies that are um, just security sensitive, uh, they're starting to take this posture that they don't want production data going as is in sandboxes. Uh, in some ways, COVID has really accelerated this because, you know, everybody's timeline changed. They became more aggressive. There's a lot more external partners they're working with. All of a sudden, offshore has become more acceptable because everybody's working from home. Uh, and now you want to, you know, if you're trying to do things faster, you can't spend two and a half, three weeks going back and forth on some sort of an NDA or a paper contract. You're trying to accelerate it. And one of the ways of accelerating and onboarding people quickly is if you don't have production data in sandboxes, the risk is significantly lower, right? You're like, okay, great. We want to bring somebody on. You know, here is a very simple NDA that you, you know, sign or some contract you sign. You give them access into a sandbox. They can start developing. They can test against a full copy. So that's on the security and the business side of it. From a legal perspective, and again, I'm not a lawyer. The, the reasoning around this is that when you're, when I'm sharing my information with a company, the intention is that only people who are authorized to access it are, are accessing it, right? When you take this into a sandbox where almost by design people have elevated access, I may be a third party contractor doing testing for you guys and now I'm in your sandbox. I'm looking at actual business data, right? And I, by the way, I'm an S admin with a view all data privilege. So I'm looking at a lot more things that you would never ever allow me to look at in a production environment. Even as an employee, I may have no access to this information in your prod environment, 
right? If you're in healthcare and some of these other verticals where a lot of sensitive information is there, I have no access to it in production. Then all of a sudden in a sandbox is free for all. I think so that's driving a lot of businesses in that direction. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. All right, let me look at the question on the chat here for a minute. Uh, UK has, yes, Dave Hum, you're correct. UK still has GDPR in place. Yes, it was included. And I think some of the uh, agreements that Brussels has with the United Kingdom, particularly around data, um, what's the word they use for this? Uh, uh, they tried it, was the... Yeah, so they tried equacy, I think, is the, 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 the term that they've used on the, the GDPR stuff. Right, right. And so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the because with US, that got invalidated. I think we had a privacy shield agreement. So basically, GDPR says GDPR does not have anything for data localization. So it doesn't care if your data is in UK or Germany or, frankly, China, India, wherever. It really doesn't care. I think the thing that it says is you have to ensure that that data is accorded the same amount of protection. And uh, I think last year, uh, the treaty between Europe and US, uh, called US Privacy Shield, was invalidated. Uh, so for those of you who's gotten, who, who's interested in learning more about it, it's the Max Schrems, it's the Schrems 2 case, uh, which Max Schrems filed, which said that, well, European data is not accorded the same degree of security in the United States because NSA and other government intelligence agencies in the US have a lot more leeway on accessing this data. So I think that got invalidated, but you're correct that between UK and, and rest of the Europe, you know, that data protection still holds true. Uh, do these privacy objects need to be enabled in an org? No, Sean, uh, Ronan, no. Uh, these privacy objects are uh, enabled by default. I think a few releases ago, you had to go and check a box in setup, but now I think for every New York, Salesforce enables it by default. That's my understanding. Uh, oh, somebody answered that question. Yes, correct, Diego. Uh, um, oh, Chris, I thought this, we don't need to enable it anymore. Setup data protection and privacy. For New Orgs, I thought it was automatically enabled. Um, all right, uh, Ella. I'm from California, 360. Is it a bundle of different apps? So Ella, to your question on, can we sh can you share a bit more about customer 360 in general? My understanding of it is a bit limited, mostly because there's a web page you can look at, there is some documentation around it. But what I understand is it's uh, it's very similar to, uh, it's a managed pack app, managed package app <laughs> uh, that uh, you know offers you some degree of functionality that you need for these the six, seven things that we were looking at. And I mean, Salesforce being Salesforce, it's re evolving very quickly and I'm sure it will have a lot of features. Uh, but today I think the branding has changed. So customer 360 really just refers to Salesforce platform. This is again, my interpretation, uh, but I think customer 360 privacy center is the specific thing that I should have mentioned. That's the one that where they're building some privacy specific features. Um, Every application in a company have some degree of compliance built in, how to orchestrate all of them. So Vladimir, that is a good question. That's one of the things that some of our customers are doing. Uh, you know, back to that diagram that I was showing earlier. Uh, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Like this, this diagram here. So you have two options. You could buy some third party solution and let it orchestrate all this, which means, you know, of course you're writing integration and all that. Or you can do it with Salesforce. One, one, like some of our customers are, are doing that, right? Like, because Salesforce has all these automation, you're still writing more code to quote unquote orchestrate in other areas, but you can leverage Salesforce as a privacy orchestration engine, right? Where you can take a request, right? This is Salesforce, we've taken cases forever, right? We, our DSAR data subject access request is all based on cases. And the idea is that you can take a request on a, you know, on a Salesforce page uh, as with free communities or login communities or your own website through Web2Case or email, however you want to do it. And then you can uh, basically run it through the whole process. That is exactly what we do. We take a case with specific record types for all these RTBF portability, things like that. And then we have written everything in Apex too anonymize data to kind of pull data, do things like that. 
we can we also support invocables for that. But what you can do is you can extend the same thing out, right? You can say, I got an RTBF request. I'm using cloud compliance to do it inside Salesforce. Then I'm going to call, make a call out to my NetSuite. And then I've written something in NetSuite that's going to do it. Because no matter what choice you make here, you buy a third party app, you still have to go back into those individual applications. And in most cases, you have to write something there internally to, to make it happen. And then you're just integrating them. So that's kind of the challenge that customers have. Like a number of times I have, I have customers where they've bought this and then they're like, oh, great, this is awesome. I've got a portal that I can take a request, but I can't do anything about it in Salesforce, particularly if I have to you know, remove information of someone that's a community user. Like I can't re- delete that record, right? So there's a lot more nuance there that they then have to eventually deal with. Uh, thank you, Regina. Uh, thanks everyone. What- now, I completely yeah. forgot to stop you in the middle, but uh, Todd, we've got a quiz ready, don't we? Oh yeah. I think we've got, so we, are we going to do like a two-parter? Cause I, I, my bad, I forgot to stop it in the middle to, to do the first one. No, that's all good. We can, we can, I can, I can bundle them up. We'll do one, one big quiz and then we'll have prizes for, I don't know, first, second and third place. How about that? Ooh, third that- place. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's the prize for third place? <laughs> so I, I, I put my hands up. I found, um, I found an extra cert voucher. I thought I'd been managing these and I haven't yet got around to putting all the management of these into, into a Salesforce org. Um, and I found in a Google doc, a, a cert voucher that runs out in July. And I thought we'll pluck that on as a third place one. So it's, the others have a, a longer expiry time, um, which is, I don't know when, uh, oh, December. But there's one that has July on the so I thought we'd put that as third place and that kind of makes it pretty even, right? So first and second place, free cert voucher, yeah. uh, free exam, and third place, free exam soon. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just an extra kick up the backside, I guess. Um, and fourth place, pick pick either one of uh, of the small humans behind Todd. Oh, I was, I <laughs> you'd think that you think that I'd have kind of got used to being able to concentrate and, and zone, but I can't. Um, although my daughter has shown me. She's put an Iron Man mask on Astro during this time. Perfect. That's on right. Astro. <laughs> yeah. so, um, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that any of them, my little mascots down here, have got their cl- normal clothes on. They usually come in with like other outfits on, but they seem to be mostly dressed as normal. <laughs> oh, they're hiding now. She's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, we can do the we could do the quiz now. I don't know if there's any more questions? Yeah, um, I might ask one more. Is that right? From anyone but Chris. Right, quickly slip that in. Is that right? Uh, so you can skip it if you want. No, of course not. Uh, I had a, a quick question around the individual object. Um, so it sounds like it sounds like it works quite well if you've got like duplicates because you can have the one individual record um, and link it to multiple um, like contacts as an example, which I think is quite cool. Um, but if I was in a world where, I don't know, I'm a big company and I've got multiple subsidiaries and I decide to have my company and my two subsidiaries in the same org and I have, you know, the option, you know, and I want to keep one contact um, so I can see how they're working, you know, to see everything that's related across my parent company and my two subsidiaries. How does the individual object work at that point? Because do I not need more than one for the subsidiaries or is there a way that works? Have you come across that yet? Yeah, I think this is a this is an incredibly good question. It, 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 you know where you're going, where this question leads us is, is, is the deeper issue that so many times never gets discussed. Uh, by the way, though, Pabs happens to be my favorite beer. So kudos to that, man. That is awesome. <laughs> I, I couldn't focus on individual with the pabs going back. <laughs> cool. I've been to their brewery. In, they have a brewery in Milwaukee here. So anyway, <laughs> um, so back to individual object. Um, if you think about, actually for a minute, let's talk about consent management. See, one of the things that really nobody talks or very few people talk and think about when they talk about consent management is 
consent is a Trojan horse, right? The idea that you can do consent management is, is it's, it's trivializing the fact that underneath it, you better have a customer data master, right? Like a master data management for customer, because unless I can unify across the enterprise, one golden copy of a customer, I really can't do a good job of consent management, particularly if you're a large company with, you know, four, five, 10, 20, 30 Salesforce orgs, it's a nightmare, right? And, and like, this is one thing that most companies that I've spoken to actually don't think about. They're like, yeah, yeah, we'll buy something to do consent management. Yeah, good luck with that. I've been in industry for 20 years and I have rarely seen a customer master program going well. You would spend three to five years doing it. By the time it gets done, everybody has lost interest. Half the time it doesn't do well. There's like all kinds of challenges. So that problem continues, right? What you're doing with individual is you're trying to eliminate this problem within Salesforce. If you have multiple orgs, you could designate one of them as sort of the primary org and then do it, right? So a while back, uh, you know, one of the customers I was working with, they wanted to solve this problem across the board, right? There are this business with like eight different entities, uh, extremely, you know, well-to-do business, very broad all across the world, different regions, very, very complex, uh, but very heavily invested in Salesforce. So they have like 20, 30 orgs. And what we wanted to do there was really use external identity as in, in one org as a centralized, this is pre-individual, right? So you probably want to go down that route. See, if you look at the whole customer 360 idea, at the end of the day, that's kind of what Salesforce is headed towards, right? You would have one org, maybe integrated via MuleSoft or something, that's gonna pull people from different places, have a really sophisticated matching capability to say same email address, so, you know, same uh, IPs, same zip code, same phone number, and then create one consolidated record and then take that individual ID or party ID, which is what it's called now, and push it back into your respective ecosystem. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, long-winded answer uh, to- No, nah, that, that's fine, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was just wondering if you'd come across it before because I know that's something that I see quite often across yeah, Salesforce I, orgs. Yeah, I do. There's really no, like, this is like grab the bull by the horn type approach. Expensive, complex, not easy, not trivial. Like, if you ask me, I have six orgs, I will tell you my product won't cut it for you. Like, this is not a problem. <laughs> All right, now let's go. All right. Do you have memories of using Informatica beans for, <laughs> for master data management? Um, so I, I wanted to ask you just one more thing, if I have time. Um, in my case, we are doing sort of a second approach in that we are implementing our GDPR right to be forgotten um, policy across systems. And um, a separate team is implementing, I guess, the main orchestration via Kafka. Um, so on our on the Salesforce side, we are sort of left with a situation where we receive an instruction to anonymize somebody and then we have to go in and, and, and um, anonymize them. So the approach that we've taken is marking all of our fields that are needed for anonymization with compliance group PII or GDPR. And then we literally, when we get the instruction, we query the field definition table for everything involves compliance groups and then go ahead and anonymize it. Is there anything obvious that I could be doing that is simpler that I am missing? Yeah, so it's it's a fairly common use case that we see with a lot of our customers. Um, you know, they have some other system that's kind of the upstream and it's gonna send you some requests to anonymize. Um, so we actually, uh, for a lot of the stuff that I was talking about, we created REST APIs for that reason. So most of our uh, features are exposed via REST API, a lot of them by invocable, you know, just for, for those kind of specific cases. So if you have something coming in, uh, you know, it, it, it could directly call our REST API if, you know, if, if that's uh, an option uh, or like, in, you know, you may have like a platform event or something uh, that, you know, we can be, uh, we can trigger off and, and leverage that approach. Uh, what we do is internally, we dynamically, you know, as when the product is installed, we create mappings for each of these. What do you want to de-identify down to a field level? 
and you want to delete chatter, task, this, that, you know, all of that stuff. And then basically you make an API call and we can do that. The other scenario that I actually get more often is that most right to be forgotten request, particularly if you're doing it in a more mature org, you know, you're probably talking about uh, anonymizing a significant amount of data. It's not just contact, right? It's cases, transactions, custom object, managed package object, all that stuff. And so what we do for them, uh, like we have a synchronous call, but you know, that doesn't frankly get that much use. We initially built it, it's all async. So you, you make a request, we actually do create a case internally, like a, a DSAR record type, and then we log everything against it. And what that does is it allows you to kind of ping it and get like status, right? Because so in your first call, we send you like basically a case ID, and then you can keep on getting the status of, is it done, is it done, is it done? And we deliberately make it async because, you know, if you're a mature customer, you may have to anonymize 10,000 records, right? I'm not gonna time out on a sync call and then kind of deal with that, so. Did I answer the question or? No, it did, it did, because um, similar situation, we're probably going for an async approach just because um, we've started mapping these field entities and there are just so many. Uh, so um, no, it does make sense. Yeah. See, the other challenge that happens with that is like you do all this and the minute you add another uh, field in your next release, this goes out of <laughs> out of sync, right? Now I have social security number field or tax ID or something that I just added in the next release. But my Apex class that's going to go out and anonymize a bunch of this information wasn't aware of this. So we had to kind of make this very declarative where you could at least just go immediately and add it and then run it all through a very data driven, you know, Apex code that's just reading what all am I anonymizing and that can change on a daily basis. Yeah, cool, thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Here, I thought I followed you on the uh, Bob Buzzard blog and I'm a huge admirer of you. I thought you'll ask me some interesting questions. So I'm curious if you have any for me. <laughs> but actually, I'm, I'm slightly tapped out on this topic because I'm going through, I say 27,001 at the moment. Oh. So um, it's quite a relief to watch somebody else being asked these kind of questions <laughs> rather than me being involved in it. <laughs> well, that's on, that's another roadmap. Do we want to get, uh, you know, 27011, right? That's the one. Uh, and for those on the call who are not aware of, one of the challenge for global organizations is like, I don't want to keep on complying with GDPR and LGPD and CCPA and this and that. And ISO 27701 is a regulation that tries to encompass all of that. So if you comply with 27701, you effectively comply with a lot of those requirements. That's kind of the underlying thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it means that everybody takes responsibility for for their kind of their own data within the various systems that you have as well. So there's a there's a lot of collaboration required around that. It's an interesting time, I must say, an interesting time. <laughs> I may have to reach out to you later to figure out how painful it was, because I want to do that in the you know the in H two air, but I <laughs> I the, myself. It's, I've been through the. I've done a few other ISOs as well, nine thousand and nine thousand and one, and. One thing they all put a lot of stock in is documentation and that that's always a slightly painful bit. True, true, yeah. <laughs> I get a consultant involved, they would be my advice. Get a specialist involved because they they can, they can um, just understand the terminology, which can be difficult if you don't come from that background. True, true. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking with one, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Any comments, any feedback? Like, were there things that we should have talked about that I didn't? Uh, There's okay. one question in the chat, sir, from Nawaz. Nawaz, as you've said, you have customers wanting to manage consent across various systems. Does your solution also manage consent for data which isn't on Salesforce? Uh, uh, no, Nawaz, we don't. And I think like this goes back to that one customer master. That, that is a challenge. You've got to bring this data into one system, whether it's Salesforce or something else, because uh, it's otherwise just not possible to, you know, kind of relate it to consent, individual object, all of that, particularly from a Salesforce perspective. Uh, the areas where, uh, you know, some other approach may be interesting, and I haven't tried this, 
is like for right to be forgotten. You know, I've not tried using external objects. So maybe, you know, like I may not have data in Salesforce, but I want to maybe just anonymize it because I'm accessing it to external objects. I've not tried something like that, but when it comes to consent, no, you, you have to need, you need one centralized source, which is what I was saying earlier. That's one of the biggest challenges that people will be like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to buy a consent management platform. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, it's not really going to solve your problem as robustly as you need it to be solved. And this, this space is going to continue to be very, very thorny of everything we've talked about this, like all the enterprise architecture thinking and how seriously you're going to look at data modeling comes to bear on this more than others.